Good afternoon. My name is Dwayne Brown with NASA's Office of Communications. Welcome to NASA headquarters. Today you will hear new details about the structure of solar storms and also hear how they impact here on Earth. Today's briefing materials are on the internet at www.nasa.gov slash stereo, in addition to www.nasa.gov slash sunearth, all one word. We'll have brief presentations from our presenters, then we will open it up with questions starting here in Washington, on NASA centers, and the phone lines. I'd like to introduce you to today's participants. First up, Lika Guha-Takurta, Lead Program Scientist for NASA's Living with a Star Program and also Program Scientist for Stereo. Craig DeForest, Staff Scientist, Southwest Research Institute, Boulder, Colorado. Dave Webb, Research Physicist, Institute for Scientific Research, Boston College. And Alisa Reinert. Research Scientist, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in the University of Colorado, also in Baltimore. And with that, I'll turn it over to Lika. Thank you, Dwayne. Stereo is a mission in NASA's uh, heliophysics division, and heliophysics is an emerging new science discipline. The goal of this division is to understand the sun as a magnetic variable star and its effect on Earth, as well as the entire solar system. As you might know, we live in the outer atmosphere of this star, which at times can be stormy and turbulent, giving rise to the phenomenon of space weather that we hear about so often these days. So the three main objectives of this division is to really understand the basic plasma physics processes from sun to earth and the solar system, um, which is vast, very complex, very dynamic, to understand the physics of the interaction between sun's magnetic field and earth's own, which is where space weather phenomenon is felt, and then also to develop the scientific understanding necessary to really create these uh, forecasting capabilities of these extreme dynamic conditions in space that is experienced by human or robotic explorer wherever we choose to go. This is accomplished in a variety of ways. We have a research portfolio along with a set of flight programs that provide unique observations from really strategically located vantage point which is very important for gaining the physics understanding that we are seeking. The flight programs are three. The Explorer program, which are typically small missions led by individual principal investigators focusing on you know, a subset of very small questions to which we can find scientific answers. Then we have two strategic lines, Solar Terrestrial Probe, and that goes after really science questions for science sake, and stereo mission is actually part of this program. And finally, we have Living with the Star program, which is another strategic flight program line, where we actually look for missions that have um, really go after cutting edge science, as well as look for relevance to life and society. Solar Dynamics Observatory is an example in that category. If I could have the first, um, systems observatory slide, what you're looking at there is um, the heliophysics systems observatory. We call it evolving heliophysics system observatory because we are continually retooling it, replenishing it. Um, and so the white satellites there are our operating missions, and the ones in yellow are really our future missions that we are uh, developing right now. There are about 16 such operating missions. And so just looking at that, uh, you realize that we have been studying this system for a while. But it is a really uh, vast distance and a very complicated dynamic environment. So just a decade or two is not sufficient to fully understand 
uh, this uh, system. And so what we try to do is we try to bring in uh, new missions uh, with new, which lend to new scientific insights and retire some of the old ones from which we have already gained the science understanding uh, that we need. And in, in this context, I think stereo is playing a really vital role with its imaging capability as well as its in situ measurement capability. What you also see in this picture, what might appear to you is that there are just a large number of spacecraft. So just to kind of give you a perspective, the distance between the sun and earth is 93 million miles. Well, it's not really obvious in this picture, but if you can imagine the sun being the size of a basketball, uh, in comparison then the earth would be like a pinhead. And now you take these two objects and you put them at the two extreme ends of a basketball court. That's what you're looking at. That's the distance. And if you think about it in that terms, then these few satellite observations are really nothing. Uh, it, it's like measuring the ocean currents with just few buoys. And it's very difficult to get a full perspective of the ocean current if you're trying to do that. So you understand the enormity and the complexity that we are trying to understand uh, uh, with these satellites. And what, what Stereo is doing is really with its uh, imaging instruments, uh, it's actually giving us a perspective on the turbulent solar wind and solar storms. And it is really giving us a picture which is a global image which replace, uh, replaces sort of the buoys in some sense. If I could have now a picture of the, uh, the stereo perspective and uh, what stereo mission was launched about five years ago, October of 2006. Uh, the two spacecraft uh, kind of launched from Earth orbit and one spacecraft known as Stereo A, not a very imaginative name, but it, it's kind of leading the Earth orbit. Stereo B is lagging behind, and they are drifting at a rate of about 22 degrees per year. And what these two spacecraft do is initially they gave us a three-dimensional view of the solar wind and solar storms. And as they drift away now, they give us unique vision of the storms that are coming towards us. And the picture that you see is essentially a schematic cartoon of the particular storm that we are going to discuss in detail in this press conference, which took place in December of 2008. The two stereo spacecraft had a, a angular width of about 45 degrees. Uh, stereo two spacecraft achieved its opposition, meaning they were 180 degrees apart in early February of this year, and they continue to drift. They will eventually go behind the sign, but today they are about 164 degrees uh, behind. So just five years ago, if you think about it, solar wind was largely invisible to us. We could measure it with our spacecraft like ACE and WIND at Earth orbit. And solar storms could be viewed with spacecraft like SOHO very close to the sun. With Stereo's five telescopes today, we are actually witnessing the solar wind. We can see them, solar wind and solar storm blowing all the way from sun to earth, which, which, which is pretty incredible when you think about it. Sheer observations from stereo have improved our ability to predict arrival of solar storms at earth hugely, and you will hear about it in detail a little bit later. But the physics knowledge that we have gained from such observation is pretty impressive too. Now what you have to remember that we are now able to provide constraints for our models. Models need input, data input, like density, velocity, magnetic field strength, its direction, shape of these structures, which really give us a sense of the magnetic topology that bound these structures. And with this, we are actually able to do much better modeling. And that is really very, important. You know, sometimes we've seen many solar storms and you think maybe all of them are traveling and arrive at um, Earth. That's not the case. 
a lot of stuff goes on between the sun and earth. Some solar storms are kind of deflected or eaten away by solar wind. Some storms actually speed up in their transit. Some slow down. Um, you know, some s storms have their structure kind of distorted by the environment of the solar wind that they are traveling through. And so it, 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 it's, a, and then stereo is actually observing all of this, all the way from the beginning to the end. And so to give a really detailed description of one such storm is Craig DeForest. Thank you, Lika. So the news today uh, is that for the first time, we've been able to image a coronal mass ejection uh, with lots of detail and a photometric quality all the way through its entire life cycle from the inside of the solar corona until it impacted the Earth three days and 93 million miles later. Uh, now this was enabled by new processing methods that were applied to archival data from the international SECI instrument on board stereo. So uh, I'd like to introduce a, a movie of the science. We've combined five separate cameras views into one frame. And I'll just give you the, the movie to start with. So if we could roll the science movie here. On the right side of the frame, you see the lower solar corona, and you'll see a coronal mass ejection form down in the corona and be launched into space, crossing the entire solar system until it becomes a 50 million mile high wall of plasma about to envelop the Earth. Now, for a sense of scale, the Earth on your screen would be microscopic. We've actually drawn a little icon on there because you wouldn't be able to see it otherwise. So the scale of these, these events is simply immense. Uh, for the first time, we're able to actually track through these outer regions of the, of the image here on the left-hand side in black and white uh, as the structure evolves and distorts before impact. Uh, so for 40 years or more, we've understood that the sun occasionally hurls billion-ton clouds of material at one to three million miles an hour into interplanetary space. When those clouds impact the Earth, they cause space weather effects that affect our technology, uh, cause auroras, that sort of thing. Uh, but until now, we couldn't see any detail in these structures after about 10 degrees from the sun. And the result is that everything uh, outside of that has been extrapolation. So we've been unable to connect the very detailed structures we see at the Earth back to the solar structures that gave rise to them in the first place. Uh, but now, uh, we can identify which parts of the CME came from the sun and which parts were swept up from the solar wind in its path. We can see how the CME is modified as it propagates and grows across the solar system. Uh, and we can get a first look at how the magnetic structure that drives the CME changes and evolves as it pushes the bright material in front of it, sweeping up solar wind to impact uh, the planets or spacecraft that sample it. Uh, so to track CMEs, we've been mentioning uh, there are five cameras that we have to combine, and they have vastly different scales. So I'd like to show you what we did to prepare these images so you could see them. Uh, we if we could roll the zoom movie, please. We begin with an ultraviolet telescope image of the sun. We zoom out until we can see Venus and the Earth more than 45 degrees away from the sun. However, we can't see the corona. So we've distorted the coordinate system into radial coordinates, which allows us to see the entire system in one screen. Uh, the, the scale changes drastically from the right to the left. On the right-hand side, we have the sun. On the left-hand side, we're looking at whole planets uh, and, the, and the distances between them. Uh, now, the outer cameras, the outer four cameras in that field of view, uh, the sepia tone and the black and white, measure ordinary sunlight that's been scattered off of free electrons in the plasma clouds in the, in the solar system. Uh, close to the sun, that, that light is easy to measure. It's relatively bright compared to the stars. But by the time the cloud reaches Venus, it's 10 billion times fainter than the surface of the full moon. It's about 1,000 times fainter than the galaxy or the star field in deep space behind the, the images. So it was a tremendous achievement to separate the two signals. It was very difficult to separate the the signal from the clouds from the star field that's superimposed upon it. Uh, it's a testament to the quality of the instruments from NRL and the Rutherford Labs that we're able to drill this far into the data and actually find something there at the bottom. Uh, so moving back to the science, let's review the data uh, that I showed you at the beginning in slower motion. Now pay close attention, not just 
to the bright front as it sweeps across, but to the dark void behind it. And I'll narrate as we run the gauge movie here. Uh, so again, we'll see the event form in the lower corona. It's visible in the ultraviolet. Uh, and we'll see it propagate through the brown-toned lower corona and out into the heliosphere, growing and distorting as it moves. You can see the, uh, the dark region behind the front is full of magnetic field, and that's what's driving the event. Uh, as it picks up material from the surrounding solar wind and gains brightness in front, the magnetic field, the magnetic flux rope that's doing the pushing distorts. When the whole event hits the Earth, the wind gauge pegs at 20 atoms per cubic centimeter and then returns back to normal levels, uh, indicating that, in fact, we are measuring the appropriate thing. That gauge is driven by in situ measurements from NASA's wind spacecraft that was actually at the Earth and detecting the, this event as it went by. Uh, so to sum up, uh, we have the, for the first time, we've tracked a complete CME life cycle from the interior of the corona out to the, to the Earth. Uh, this was achieved by reprocessing existing data from really stunningly high quality uh, uh, archives from stereo. And uh, this should give us new insights into how solar storms evolve and connect the events that we can measure at the Earth back to their solar origins. With that, for more context, I'll hand you over to Dave Webb. OK, thank you, Craig. Um, these movies are very important to uh, solar wind studies, especially those that involve uh, the evolution and inter interaction of this material in the inner heliosphere. Heliospheric imaging itself bridges uh, a gap between observations near the sun and those uh, much further out at the distance of the Earth or beyond, as we've seen here. Um, now, the solar wind is a hot plasma which flows out from the solar corona of the sun and is guided by magnetic field lines um, that spiral out from the sun in a garden hose pattern because of the rotation of the sun. Uh, now, if we could show the movie. Uh, this is a 3D simulation model of um, the solar wind and a CME moving out through it that was taken during the first 10 days of this month, August. Um, this view on the left shows the circular view, shows the ecliptic plane, which is the plane that the planets move in around the sun. So it's looking down on that plane. Um, you can see the curved dashed lines are, the, are these uh, magnetic field lines that uh, are rotating around the, with the sun. And the colors are the density pattern in this model. Um, uh, the brighter colors are denser structures. And uh, the other view on the right is a north-south cut through the um, plane, Earth, sun-earth plane, uh, showing you kind of the vertical component. And this is a, similar to the views that we're seeing from the HI uh, images that Craig just showed. Um, now, the plasma can be compressed uh, along the original field lines, so that will give you a long curvilinear de density structure, which co-rotates with the sun. Now, when the CME comes out, you can see that it distorts those field lines considerably. Um, and it, the CME itself drags its own plasma and magnetic fields out into the heliosphere along with it. Uh, so these studies of the solar wind and co-rotating structures, as well as the CMEs and the interactions the CMEs make with these structures, uh, all will benefit from this kind of imaging that we're seeing today. Now, we have been able to image the inner heliosphere before. In the 70s and 80s, 1970s and 80s, we had the Helios solar probes, uh, which uh, wrote, were in orbit around the sun. But they had uh, a resolution that was much poorer in time and space than what we're seeing today. There wasn't another instrument like this until 2003, when the Air Force um, built and launched the solar mass ejection imager into Earth orbit. And of course, then the, the stereo HIs we're seeing now were launched in uh, late 2006. Data was taken early in 2007. So it was almost four years later. Uh, SME was very successful, but it can't be within 20 to 30 degrees of the sun. It has noise because it's in Earth orbit from particles and aurora in Earth orbit. And it's also nearing the end of its lifetime. Uh, aside from uh, SME and the HI instruments, there are no other telescopes right now that can view the inner heliosphere like we're seeing today. So these uh, observations are now achieving a goal that scientists have had or worked towards for about four decades now. Uh, this 
the goal is to observe and understand the basic structure of the solar wind. The observations allow us to separate CMEs from co and co-rotating flows and also to, uh, to better uh, visualize and understand the different parts of a CME. For instance, the sheath region, uh, which is plowed ahead of the CME as it's moving out in, through the heliosphere, has a density which is likely related to the strength of the CME following behind it. This has space weather implications that we'll hear about in a minute. Finally, uh, these images will permit global views of the solar wind and CMEs and so forth when this data is put into various kinds of models, such as the one I just showed you. Uh, now we'll turn it over to Alicia, who will discuss the space weather aspects. Thank, Thank you. you. <clears throat> so I'm a researcher at the NOAA Space Weather Prediction Center, or SWPC, we call it. Uh, SWPC is responsible for operational space weather forecasting, and so, so we complement the basic research that's done at NASA. They uh, help us understand these events, and then, and then at, at NOAA we try to forecast when one of these events will happen. And the reason we care uh, is because when one of these CMEs, one of these coronal mass ejections, past the Earth, they can cause problems with uh, satellites. Uh, we've had a couple cases where uh, power grids have been disrupted. Um, GPS signals can be uh, made inaccurate when these storms are passing. So it's good to know in advance um, so we can be able to warn people who rely on these technologies that, that there may be problems. The CMEs also cause the aurora, so you know they're not all bad. We, we have some good benefits from that. Um, NASA helps us with our predictions by providing, by both the basic research to help us understand these events and by providing what we call beacon data, which is lower resolution data that can be um, beamed to SWPC forecasters instantly so that they can make their forecasts with the latest observations available. Now, uh, before STEREO was launched, we had the SOHO LASCO instruments, and that, that's how we uh, observed our CMEs. And so if we roll this movie we have here, we can see some CMEs in, with uh, LASCO. This was a very active time, so you see a lot of CMEs, these bubbles of plasma coming out in all different directions. Now, the forecasters used this to, uh, we, we can measure the speed of these CMEs, but there are a couple problems. One of them is that the CMEs we care about are the ones that are coming towards us. And so because of the angle, uh, it's a little more difficult to measure the velocity. And you also get these proton events, like you can see here. Um, the other problem is that SOHO images very close to the sun. And so you're only seeing the early stages of these CMEs as they're coming out. Um, so you can measure the velocity, but the CME may speed up or slow down as it heads out towards the Earth. Uh, we have models that try to account for this, but, but they're still a bit um, inaccurate. We, we can get a window of about 12 to 14 hours of when we think the CME will get to the Earth. And of course, you know, we'd like to do better than that. Uh, with the stereo HI instruments, with, with stereo, once stereo is launched, you have a, we have a couple of benefits. And one of those is that stereo is moving away from the Earth, so you get a side view of the CME, so you can measure the speed a lot more accurately. Also, with the HI instruments, you're able to image the CME all the, as it goes out from the sun much further out towards the Earth. And so just using these, uh, images, uh, these images as they were, we're able to improve our predictions to about uh, an eight-hour window at the Earth. And we think that with uh, Craig's technique, we can do even better than that, because now we're able to really see the CME all the way out to the Earth in detail and see a lot of the substructures. Uh, and um, this is a, it's a big advance, and, 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 and just to explain that, it, it's like trying to understand how a hurricane is moving across the ocean by just having a couple buoys who are, that are measuring the wind speed versus now, you know, these, these uh, movies that we can see on the news of the hurricane actually moving across the ocean. So, so that's what it is to us, and now we're actually seeing the CME moving across the sky, um, and it's, it's really, uh, it's amazing to see, and it really helps our predictions. Um, so timing is very important, knowing when the event will get to the Earth. But the other thing is whether the CME will actually cause problems at the Earth. And that has to do with the magnetic field. So the Earth has a magnetic field that's called the magnetosphere, and it has a direction associated with it. And these CMEs have directions too. And the, the way to understand that is if you've ever played with a, a magnet, a couple magnets, you know, if you turn them one way, they'll repel each other, and if you turn them the other, they'll attract. So if a CME has what we call a, a, a northward field, it's more likely, uh, well, let's roll this next video, actually. So if a CME has a northward field, it's more likely to bounce off the 
uh, Earth's magnetosphere. And here we have a CME, it's, it's leaving the sun. And this one's gonna have a southward field so we can see what happens when, when that sort of uh, CME hits the Earth. Um, here we're going to see these blue lines are the magnetic field of the Earth. And as the CME gets to the Earth, you see it, it's actually pulling apart the, the, the field and it um, causes a series, a chain of events, which eventually lead to um, the aurora. And so obviously we, we wanna be able to predict what the magnetic field of these CMEs are. And up until now, we haven't been able to do that. But we have some indications that using um, Craig's techniques, Craig's uh, results, we, we're able to link the structures of the CME with the magnetic field that we measure at the Earth. And we think that if we combine that with some additional observations, then we can start to make some predictions of what the CME magnetic field will be. Now, this is pretty preliminary. We need to do more study to be sure, but this would be potentially pretty groundbreaking. So um, to sum up, this is a great result where it's very exciting um, and has important impacts for space weather research. And so now let me turn this back to Lika. Thanks, Alicia. So you can see as, as we approach the peak of this next solar cycle 24, maybe somewhere in 2013, we now have the necessary tools, data, and models to improve the physics understanding of space weather, which is what we are after. However, missions like STEREO are really science satellites, uh, which will not always be there to provide us with these critical observations in the Sun-Earth system. That is why we invest in physics, understanding and modeling of this uh, phenomenon, and uh, heliophysics system observatory kind of aid in that process. For example, we are now, as you heard earlier, able to verify uh, models with ground truth verification at Earth from our um, measurements from our satellites like ACE and WIND. And um, in this uh, plot that we have up there, that is kind of the same plot that I showed earlier, except now we have put all our operating missions and future missions on a solar cycle uh, time frame. And so operating missions are 16 operating missions already going on. What you can see is that there are some future missions that's coming up that will continue to really uh, retool our um, heliophysics systems observatory. Uh, next year, we will be launching Radiation Bell Storm Probe, and that's two spacecraft that will be placed in Earth's radiation belt. This is the geospace environment, which is where we actually feel the impact of solar storms and is, is most important to us and we will be under, trying to understand the consequence of a solar storm. And then in distant future, in uh, 2018, NASA plans really a daring mission to the sun itself, and it is going to a mission called Solar Pro Plus that is going to go to the outer atmosphere of the sun, the corona, to really measure uh, the particles and the plasma, much like we do with ACE and wind at Earth, to provide that ground truth uh, verification for our models, you know, the beginning and the end. And this is, this is the environment in which solar wind is created and solar storms uh, propagate. Uh, so this is, this is an exciting period in heliophysics. With that, I'll pass it on to you, Dwayne. Well, thank you, Lika, and to our panel. So we are now going to open it up for questions, and we're gonna actually go to the phone lines first, and we're gonna head out to the West Coast. And first up, is David Perlman from the San Francisco Chronicle. David? Yeah, thanks very much. And I, I have one two-part question. Uh, do CMEs always originate within active sunspot regions? And then the second part of that question uh, is, are any of you familiar with a report that's coming out in Science on Friday about the ability of a Stanford group uh, to predict the onset of sunspots uh, from, uh, from the SOHO satellite uh, that has been looking at the interior of the sun to actually predict the emergence of sunspots. And would somebody, whoever answers this, would you please identify yourself? Because I don't have a, I'm not in the studio audience. Okay. 
Thanks, David. Uh, Craig, did you want to take the first question, or is that going to be uh, oh, Dave? Sure. Oh, Dave, Dave will take that. Okay. I, Dave is here. I, I, uh, as far as the, uh, what CMEs uh, are associated with or come from back at the sun, uh, many of them, especially the most energetic, are associated with active regions and, and flaring in active regions. But uh, many are also associated with um, prominence eruptions or filament eruptions, which can exist. These are uh, clouds of uh, cool gas that exist in the solar atmosphere. We don't quite know why. They're suspended by the magnetic field. And for some reason, they can erupt. And when they erupt, they also can form mass ejections, coronal mass ejections. So uh, these can also, active regions, of course, tend to be confined to the lower latitudes of the sun, whereas prominence can can occur anywhere over the sun, even uh, towards near the poles. And so therefore, uh, CMEs uh, can uh, occur anywhere from the low latitudes to the high latitudes. Uh, and near solar minimum, it's more towards the low latitudes. So this can vary over the solar cycle. So that was uh, Dave Weber speaking. Craig, did you want to add to that? Or is that anyone well, want to add to that? Question, second question, maybe. Second question? You want to answer? Um, yeah, yeah. Like, like Dave said, the, um, the, the biggest CMEs do come from active regions uh, m most often. And so, so we do care about when there is an active region, um, when, when an active region may be emerging. And especially early on, when, right when the active region emerges, you can often get a lot of CMEs. Um, I'm only uh, m partly familiar with this, this new research, but it is pretty exciting to be able to use uh, a helioseismology to look underneath the sun and try to predict when an active region will appear. And I, th I think I will uh, add to that. I, I, I think uh, uh, this is one of the reasons we um, actually launched Solar Dynamics Observatory, which is the first mission of Living with a Star, really to understand uh, helioseismology in greater detail and penetrate uh, deeper into the convection zone where these, um, the, these magnetic structures are formed. And so SOHO MDI has given us the first cut of uh, good statistics. And this result is actually going to be sharpened by using the Solar Dynamics Observatory's uh, uh, helio, uh, HMI uh, instrument. So th this, this is pretty groundbreaking. We are delighted to have this. We will have. Uh, uh, online press release on Monday. Stay tuned. Craig, did you? Are you uh, talking? Okay. Okay. And uh, David, that was uh, Lika talking. Uh, and then, of course, that was Dave and Alicia. Alicia. Okay. I'm going to get that right. I'm determined to get that name right. Okay. Uh, next up on the call, Peter Spots from the Christian Science Monitor. Peter. Oh, thanks. Yeah, thanks for doing this. And actually, uh, uh, Dave scooped me on the uh, on the question there. But I wonder if if taking both of these results together, if you could just kind of place this in in a in a kind of parallel context. I mean, how does this how do these developments as 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 early as they are, but as promising as they are, uh, can you think of a, a a similar time, for example, in the history of weather forecasting, where you sort of had the same sort of potential breakthrough technologies? Um, coming along, uh, just in, in trying to draw some kind of parallel for readers. This is Craig DeForest. Uh, really, you're looking at opposite ends of the same connected system here. The, 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 the Stanford group is, is studying the origin of the systems that give rise to CMEs. And we're really studying what happens to the CME after it leaves the sun and propagates all the way out to the Earth. Uh, as far as a parallel with history, uh, this really is like the beginning of space assets for weather forecasting that for the first time we're really developing systems that can get at the root, the structure of what's causing then Earth storms and now space storms around the Earth. Uh, so up till now we've, we've, we've relied on point measurements and models. And, and really for the first time we're beginning to see a complete predictive system emerging out of the science. Did you have a follow up, Peter? Thank you. Okay. Next up is Mike Wall on space.com. Mike? Going once, going twice. Mike, are you with us? Okay. All right. Let me take a question from one of the dot coms, and I believe this is going to be for all four of you all, so we just go down the row here. And 
The question is, with the public fascination of the sun, how can you personally tell the public on how we are more prepared and what we know about the sun from past, present, and future? Well, we, we, we can tell a lot, actually, as I was indicating that even five years ago, uh, uh, there were uh, stuff we didn't know. And five years later, with observations from stereo or solar dynamics observatory, our, our whole view of how the sun behaves as a magnetic variable star is changing right in front of our eyes. So it, it's, it is a really dynamic time in the history of heliophysics where um, you know, our observations are ahead of our theoretical insights and understanding. But we are seeing these things for the first time, and we are grappling as to what is going on. So um, I don't know what more to say, but this is a very rich time for understanding heliophysics and space weather evolution. Greg, your personal views? Uh, well, I have to agree with, with Lika that, that we, we're making tremendous strides. Uh, when I first got interested in this field uh, as a boy, uh, solar physics was, was sometimes referred to as dermatology because we could see features on the sun and uh, not the interior yet, uh, but we couldn't really understand them. And over the course of just my lifetime, we've seen uh, the data get better to be where we're measuring the things we need to be measuring. And we've seen the models and data processing get better to where we can really encompass this phenomenally complex system. Uh, plasma physics is extraordinary com extraordinarily complicated. Uh, the physics of solar flares involves differences in scale between things the size of Jupiter and things the size of this television studio. Uh, and, and encompassing that is just very difficult. And we've really seen a tremendous amount of this puzzle come together for the sun and by extension to stars in general, uh, just in the course of a lifetime. Well, I'll say the basic context, I think, for me would be I started out in this field in solar physics in the early 70s with a Skylab program. Uh, and at that time, we made many new exciting discoveries about looking at the sun itself in detail. Coronal mass ejections were kind of discovered, only discovered around that time, so that's 40 years ago. And, uh, and since then, you know, uh, we, at that time, we, we knew nothing about how these things really connected with the heliosphere and the Earth and so forth. We could only make uh, crude guesses at this. Now, uh, with uh, data like you're seeing today, we can actually, uh, as I said, track, uh, understand these things coming out from the sun, track them all the way to the Earth and beyond, uh, and, and understand much better uh, what they're coming, uh, what, what's happening with them as far as the system's approach goes. So we've made huge strides in my lifetime, or my working lifetime. It's very exciting to see this. Uh, and of course, now with the, we have uh, these future missions like Solar Probe, where we'll actually go into the atmosphere of the sun, uh, and that'll be very exciting. So uh, it's a very exciting time to, to be doing this work. Alyssa? Yeah, and, and I'd say um, that, that the work that I do, I, I sort of straddle the, the basic research that NASA does and the predictions that NOAA does uh, by being based at NOAA. And so I sort of I can see both sides of this, and, and it's very exciting. Um, so I echo what, what these guys have said, that this is a, is a great time where we're getting all these new observations and, and this new understanding of, of how these events happen, and, and that that's feeding into our forecast and our ability to, to predict these in advance and predict uh, you know, how powerful they'll be. And, and as we become more uh, reliant on technology, you know, our satellites and, and everything become more and more important, that makes it more important to be able to predict when these events will occur. So it's, a, it's an exciting time. OK, we're going to go back and see if we can take uh, a second go with uh, Mike Wall at, at space.com. Mike, are you with us? Uh, yeah. yeah, I just had a phone glitch. Can you guys hear me this time? Read you loud and clear. Okay, great. So, yeah, so, so actually, Stereo launched about five, yeah, about five years ago. I was just wondering, why did it take until now for you guys to sort of be able to, to see this in this new way, to see, see all this data in this new way? Well, I can address that. This is Craig DeForest. Uh, uh, this is an extraordinarily difficult extraction problem, and we've highlighted the science that we've been doing uh, more than the, the technique of extracting the data. But this is a, a very challenging uh, uh, image separation problem that we're looking 
these, these brightness clouds that you're seeing in the movie that's been prepared uh, are fluctuations of less than a tenth of a percent of the brightness of a star field image. Uh, and so just a, a tremendous amount of extraordinarily careful work was needed to develop the algorithms. And, and many teams have worked on this. Uh, so uh, as with any science group, we have the final result, but we stand on the shoulders of giants who prepared the, the, the amazing instruments that, that, that can produce the data with this quality and uh, did the groundwork of calibrating the instrument. So uh, we, need to, we need to recognize uh, the folks at NRL and Rutherford Labs for, for producing such a terrific uh, package. Okay, I think that's going to do it for today. I want to thank you all for joining us today. Again, you could go to www.nasa.gov stereo for information on this incredible mission and all of the heliophysics missions uh, at www.nasa.gov. Thank you again. Science never sleeps.